Welcome to the EI Guru podcast, a podcast completely focused on emotional intelligence. Typically, the first question I get is, what is emotional intelligence? In very simple terms, it's how we manage our emotions in our interactions with ourselves and others. Or put another way, it's being in the right state and not being in a state when under pressure. Emotional intelligence is another label for mindset. And we all know that when navigating those important conversations, we need to tap into our best. I'll be interviewing leaders and experts in this ever expanding field and sharing the data on why emotional intelligence is the difference that makes the difference in all of our relationships. Remember to share and subscribe to the EI Guru podcast. And if you have any questions, you can post them once you've subscribed. So welcome back, Joe. It's been a week since we last spoke about the emotional intelligence framework. And we big, deep dive into the six quadrants. So I just thought it'd be useful perhaps just to recap on the six quadrants, talk a little bit about that, and then get into, which I've I've had a few requests from people that have been listening to the first episode around the how to's so some how to's so people are really keen to sort of say yeah okay i sort of understand that but how do you change some of these scales because they they are all as you know very changeable and it takes practice it's about getting into a different thinking pattern which then creates different behaviors which then creates different results as we both know so the core six quadrants self-regard regard for others which is the base layer the foundational piece that drives everything within the emotional intelligence framework then um, points upwards to self-awareness and then sideways to awareness of others and then upwards again to self-management so one side is very self-focused the other side is very others focused and on the other side of that is the relationship management scales so it's like it, a three layer cake jim isn't it yeah it is the jam, yeah. jam is it the jam is in the middle which we're actually going to talk a bit more about today aren't we the awareness the awareness level absolutely Sponge because that's on either side <laughs> that's that's where it is it's uh the the jam in the middle is really where the magic happens yeah. if especially if you like jam <laughs> but it's it's the it's a, the awareness piece you know self-awareness is the king piece of the 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 critical piece of the cake so to extend that metaphor you could say the icing and the cherry on the cake is what you see sometimes but you know the real stuff for you is often going on a bit beneath the cherry on the cake the it icing. is yeah. yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> i'm going to get I'm very I've thought now. about that now sorry i'm all i'm doing make me hungry thinking, talking about this exactly i'm thinking about cake first thing in the morning so we what about the the things that we can do to enhance our self-regard so um, i i took some notes earlier around some of the things that you can do when i'm working with clients that i recommend and i and i'd like to hear your thoughts on these aspects as well joe so first off when someone's got a low self-regard the first thing that they need to start doing and and start doing pretty rapidly is to start being kind to themselves because there's an internal dialogue that's with someone that has a low self-regard that is just not healthy. And, and that then keeps them stuck in that low self-regard pattern. So, for example, let, let's just think about a, a leader or someone that's doing a presentation and they've got a low self-regard. Their internal dialogue prior to the presentation that they might be doing will be yeah i'm not particularly good at this i'm not as good as this as, as joe is uh they'll be thinking about the tricky questions that might come up and that they're not an expert in this field and they won't be able to handle the questions that come up they'll be thinking uh the last time they did this they'll re we'd be referencing back to the last time they did a presentation and it went all horribly wrong so those sort of things. So that's the first thing is to start being kind to themselves and become a, so awareness will creep into this. And we'll talk about the awareness scale a little bit uh, shortly once we've spoken about these, these steps. 
and all that self-talk is interfering with your ability to access your own conscious thinking uh, because it's cluttered with yeah. lots of noise. Yeah. And actually, if you can quiet and calm down that and be present, easier said than done. But <laughs> yeah, if you've got all this interference stopping you thinking clearly, particularly if you're doing something important when it really matters, like a presentation, then it's going to make it much more difficult. And then it can be a vicious cycle downwards, of course, because it starts going wrong because you're not being your best. Yeah. So it's their ability to their access, their ability under pressure. It goes back to that whole thing. You know, we've been talking about that on the, la on the last episode, which is why emotional intelligence is so critical for uh, performance. So self-regard, so start being kind to themselves. The second point that I made a note of, and it's, it's one of the big things that I've been talking about for years and years as a coach is to encourage um, people that I work with to use a journal. So, mm -hmm. and use a journal in a positive way in this, re in this respect. So someone with a low self-regard, I would typically get them to think about all the attributes that they admire about themselves. And they initially might find that a little bit tricky because their internal dialogue is that I'm not great. I'm not good at this compared to others. So, you know, and, and maybe write a list of all the things that they've achieved. So, you know, from when they were a little grasshopper, when they were at school, you know, some of the things that they did, some of the paintings, perhaps the running races or swimming races they might have won. And other things that they've achieved in their career, etc. You know, I mean, I always think we may have low self-regard right at the moment but inside us there's, there's still some there's a lot of high self-regard you just haven't accessed it or you've forgotten where it is it may be lying dormant somewhere and self-esteem like everything else is a habit mm. and if you just practice focusing on all the bad stuff replaying all the negative thoughts re re-experiencing negative feelings you're going to become an expert at it yeah. so become an ex what doing this diary thing is a great way to become an expert at you know, re re stimulating the positive side, which is there. You just yeah. haven't been using it enough. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. It is still there and you can reconnect it and actually reminding yourself of those some of those memories will be uh uplifting for sure. Why wouldn't it be if you if you're reminding yourself of all the good things that you've done? Yeah. And it's so, it's a cycle, isn't it? The, the thoughts, the feelings, you you your behavior, and before you know it, you're interacting better with other people they're reinforcing you so every part of it influences the other parts yeah. um, and if you can just create that uh, kick the book get the ball rolling with with a diary something small like that is very powerful starting point yeah and and there is research you know there was some research from i think it was stanford or harvard many years ago the, the old classic thing of writing keeping a journal and writing down your goals yeah. and the people that did that they then came, went back to them 20 years later and they were more successful than the people that hadn't kept a diary and hadn't set their goals, et cetera. So it is a really powerful process and it's something that I continue to sort of like encourage, invite people to, you know, start a journal. It, it might be tricky at first, but then just keep going. Do you, do you ever tell people to do it handwritten as opposed to typing it on a computer? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. I I much prefer handwritten, and I also attempt to get everyone to consider it as an a thing to do on a daily basis. So it's a ritual, it's a routine, so it becomes an actual habit. And I, and there's been so many success stories come back to me that you know initially when they struggled with it that they stayed with it, and then they've had some major breakthroughs because what you can do with a journal is you can start seeing patterns of behavior emerge. Uh, and we'll talk about that again in, in the awareness section when we're talking about awareness. I just want to get into a couple more of these mm -hmm. uh, um, how to's, you know, mm -hmm. what can you do to enhance your self-regard? So maybe the other thing to do is to consider is to stretch yourself with something new. So, again, a lot of people have fallen out of, you know, they're not having to they're not at university anymore. So reading a book, for example, so set yourself a goal. Uh, and a stretch goal, so something that you wouldn't typically do or something that you've been wanting to do, but you haven't done it. So, you know, we're getting closer towards the back end of the year. People will be starting to think about New Year's resolutions at some point. 
oh, I'll, I'll wait, I'll put that exercise program off until the new year. So I'll, you know, I'll have a weight goal that I might want to achieve or a fitness goal that they might want to achieve. So, you know, here, here in the UK, we've got the couch to 5k. I don't know whether it's gone global, but, you know, people getting off the couch and in front of the TV and actually starting a very simple program of, you know, gradually building to a 5k um, run. Um, it might be that you've got a, go a very simple goal of not drinking alcohol through the week and just having a little bit of a sort of a, a couple of glasses on the weekend. Mm -hmm. You know, those sort of things, healthy habits that you can think of that yeah. are, are a little bit of a stretch for someone. So and and achieving those things will make you feel better that you've yeah. been able to do it. And, and maybe set the goal initially very low, you know, because yeah. you said the first step was getting off the couch. And yeah. I, I don't know about you, when I go to the gym, certainly nowadays, it's more about, got to be bothered to even put the shoes on or get out of the house it's, in the winter it's even worse but if i could do that first step and say well, i'm just going to do a couple of minutes or even yep. 30 seconds but after you've done 30 seconds oh, i'll just carry on a bit by the time you've warmed up it's like you've done half an hour or something but it is it is you getting getting into that and you, you mentioned moving outside of your comfort zones i often think when we've got low self-esteem we have a, a shaky sense of okayness yes you feel good inside and the way we protect ourselves is by building very strong walls um, and staying within those comfortable places, doing what we've always done. Yeah. And it's a consequence of low self-esteem, or at least at that time in our life. And sometimes the way of breaking those walls is just doing one or two things, thinking, actually, oh, this works. This is useful to me. And consequently, you think, well, I can't be feeling that bad. And you, you endorphin, particularly if it's physical, you feel better about yourself. Yeah. So there's a big link between uh, comfort zones and self-regard. Yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. And, and I like the idea of, you know, just start, you know, just start doing it, you know, for 30 mm. seconds or a minute or so, and then you'll get into it. And the other, the other great one around that is, you know, if you're talking about the gym in particular is actually have your gym bag in the car. So if you're driving back and you're driving back past the gym, then at least you're packed and ready to go instead of having to go home, get your kit and then go back yeah. to the gym. Because once yeah. you get home, the red wine or the nice chilled white wine is in the fridge. And, you know, that's a different that's a different decision. <laughs> so the gym doesn't happen yeah. then. At least make it your reward. Maybe that's yeah. not the right thing to do. I don't know. That's conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> Forget that idea. And and the other the other thing that I think is important for us to be aware of is I spoke earlier um, before we started recording this session about the filing cabinet that we all have that we carry with us we, we've got a filing cabinet of a catalog of stuff good memories and of course lots of other memories and that aren't so good perhaps and I, I, th I think it's really important for us to be aware that people with a low self-regard tend to reference the filing cabinet and reference all the bad things that have happened and and can you know over catastrophize certain events where they then will it will then stop them from actually taking action to move forward to try something new etc mm -hmm. so that, that it's a it's a it's important to be aware of that thinking pattern that we get stuck back into as well i mean do you, do you get your clients to think of um positive scenarios that they can just you put in their filing cabinet and make another diff put it in the same cabinet put separate one visualization at least yes uh, and say actually i'm going to go back to that you know it could be the sports day as a child or having a really good chat with a friend um or coming off your coaching and doing your doing your habit change it was successful there's you just got to actively focus on it and it's where we focus our attention you know and Focusing attention is largely how we feel. And that's one of our human resources or capacities. Yep. Learning how to manage our attention and not let it control us. You know, the, it, the, visual, yeah, the visualization is a, a big one, Joe. As you mm -hmm. know, in the sporting world, the athletes are, are using visualization so well. You know, yeah. the, the gold medalist that's looking to win gold, you know, the high jumper, the, their visualization before... You know, they, they've run it hundreds of times and won the race. Yeah. You know, Mark, my mate, Mark Foster, who has, you know, won loads of medals in his career as a swimmer, went to five Olympics. 
he used visualization. He'd visualize himself in the warm up room. He'd visualize himself in each of the different lanes that he might be in. Mm -hmm. He'd visualize the tumble turn, him turning first. He'd visualize himself touching out in first position. So mm -hmm. he did all that. And of course, you know, that added an extra element to his success. That's really interesting. You know, because to he hear. saw himself, he saw himself do that, you know, and finish in first place. What you've the way he described it wasn't he 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 visualized him standing on the podium with he might have done that as well yeah he visualized tumble turning or swimming <laughs> smoothly whatever he did that works for him it's actually firing off the same neurons as if you i don't know if you'd say this as if you're doing the activity absolutely it, neurologically it, it is firing those neurons so they get rehearsed and practiced so by the time you're diving in the water those neurons are already pre hot and wired and ready to go uh -huh, yeah 100 percent and and yeah, so visualization. Say you're doing a presentation, or you've got a difficult conversation with a with a client, or whatever it might be. Visualizing what you want is far more likely to make you prepared and ready for it emotionally and physically uh, for for carrying that out. And and yeah, you're right. They they've done research around this. I mean, I talk a a, a lot about the the research they've done with athletes. You know, they mm -hmm. they looked at some college. Um, students mm. and they got them to do basketball shuttle runs mm. and they had them all wired up with the electrodes and they were measuring which muscles muscles were firing off then they got them to sit in a chair close their eyes and visualize themselves doing the shuttle runs mm. and the same muscles were firing off so you're absolutely right they do it does it is it's it's the neural pathways are being connected yeah. visually as well so that then means what they are what our athletes have started doing is they actually do the visualization so that they're actually increasing their muscle um, growth without actually having to fatigue the muscles. They're just visualizing the exercise. Yeah. yeah. Now, here's a the muscle, funny thing. Muscle memory. Yeah. Here's the funny thing. A lot of people think when I share that with them, they think, ah, so I don't have to go to the gym now then, you know, I can just sit in my chair and visualize doing the exercise and I'll be, I'll get fit it doesn't it doesn't work that way unfortunately yeah yeah but yeah no, I, i'm a great fan of um visualization because also it's focusing on where you want to be uh and the future yeah and it's, it's sort of guided imagery um expectations and we always know that emotions are another term for an expectation it's what you're anticipating to happen if you're feeling anxious you're expecting failure uh, or problems and that can galvanize and get you ready but it also restricts you but if you're expecting achievement or excitement it's going to create a different type of emotion so maybe yeah. later in this podcast we'll talk about the type of emotions that are going to elicit the behavior the performance that you want yeah and sometimes sometimes they're not the emotions you might expect so we need to be aware of what emotions they are how we create them where they come from and how we can recreate them more easily yeah that's that's a that's a that's a great and we will come to those. We'll we'll have a look at all the different feelings. Um, we we spoke about that in terms of looking at self awareness and being mm. aware of mm. when those emotions where where they come from, why I'm feeling like that, etc. Mm. Mm. One of the other things that I also you know going back to the how tos is not comparing yourself. So we I I compare myself. We all compare ourselves mm. with others, mm. but it's being conscious of. Okay, so don't compare yourself with everyone else. You are unique. There's no other copy of you on the planet. Mm. And it's it's a really powerful reminder to, to your journey's unique. So don't compare yourself with other people. Your story is very different compared to others. Mm. Mm. So it's making not sure... It's easier, easier said than done, do you think, Jim? I mean, it's a tough yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like... There's a phrase that I use, which mm. probably winds lots of people up. But it's the the it, the phrase is it's e actually it's easy to do. So this stuff okay. that we're talking about is easy yeah. to do. Yeah. yeah. The challenge for all of us that it's it the ch the big challenge is that it's easier not to. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of the things that you if so if you want to get fit, it's oh, easy yeah. to do, but yeah. it's easier not to yeah. because yeah. you just revert back to your old patterns of behavior of having the the donor or whatever you know or not going to the gym mm. etc so it's easier to do because that's the pattern that you've been used to so a lot of these things are easy to do it's yeah. just easier not to i wonder also if there's an emotion that's compatible with doing it and emotions that's compatible with not so 
for example, boredom is one of my greatest motivators. I can quite happily sit on the couch and do nothing, but then eventually I get to a sort of boredom, a, a critical point for me, uh, and it's so nauseatingly horrible feeling. I want to change it, so I go and do something active. Um, are there certain emotions that you can, you know, are going to help you get you off the couch or? do the difficult work or make that awkward com telephone conversation, maybe things you don't normally want to do. Um, but tap into that. It yeah. could be a sense of frustration can be good. Um, and some of these emotions are there. Remember, and this is something we'll talk about, all emotions are there for a reason. Evolutionary rise, the reason we had frustration was to get us to change things because we yeah. were unsatisfied. If we didn't have frustration, we would sit on the couch. We've probably never progressed as a species. So <laughs> we'd still be amoebas. All societies changes have come through strong emotions that may not be very pleasant, but yes. they they create something. They create change. So you know it's again coming back to what emotions are going to help you make the changes you want to do. Yeah the the when when you were saying that the thought that came into my head was every decision that we have is the choice is pain or pleasure so pain and pl the pain and pleasure principle mm. is is the key decider in every decision that we make so every decision is a pain and pleasure decision pain if i do or pleasure if i do you know so or pleasure if i so for for example and i'll give this as an example for someone that's attempting to give up smoking so the smoker that's smoking this one's pleasurable so i'm smoking away and i'm thinking mm. you know this is this is not going to kill me this is pleasurable i'm really enjoying this so this one's not going to kill me mm -hmm. it might be the 20,000th cigarette that i have or mm. vape that i have mm. that's going to get me but this one's not going to kill me yeah so they they associate it with pleasure now what they've got to do is they've got to reverse that and say okay so this one could kill me or actually this one will, might um shorten my life so much so that I might not see the kids grow up, uh, so much so that my health and well-being is going to suffer dramatically, et cetera. Uh, so this is not just a go at uh, smokers, by the way. I mean, this is in every aspect of our lives. So, you know, going back to your point about, you know, presentations or and anything that we do, it's about pain and pleasure. So I've got to put the effort in and I will get the reward. So there is a reward mechanism going on for sure. And you can use this in goal setting, you know, and habit change, identifying your your the thing you want to change. You may want to stop smoking or you may want to stop falling out with people or you may something's not working in your life as you'd like it to. Mm. And don't ignore all the problems with that. In fact, build them up. Say, look, what, what's what the downside? What the pe what's the pain? Yeah. Um, what the negatives? Write them all down as a list, but then look at where you want to be. So yep. this is a visualization bit, isn't it? Thinking yep. about the future right what how you'd see that what the benefits and make that list even longer than the pain the pain bits and you could go further and start saying you know what are the payoffs for the thing you're doing now you know what do you get out of it completely obviously I, there's a rational reason for it yeah um, smoking you so originally you socialized a lot with it you may have looked cool when you were a teenager mm. but now it's not working for you so well yeah? mm. and you may want to shift that to something different um and replace it with a different behavior habit that's going to get you what you want yeah a healthier habit yeah you're right yeah. absolutely and think about the what will it look like feel like when i've achieved that that goal yeah 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 so working forward towards where you want to be rather than ideally working away from the thing you want to avoid when we talk about the feelings the side of things we we'll look at positive negative feelings and negative feelings are there for a reason they're good but you, you want to spend less time there they're almost yes. like a wake-up call Ooh, this isn't right. Thanks for the message. Thanks for the feedback. I now need to act upon it and move out of this place to somewhere I want to be. Mm. So acknowledge it, pay attention, and then act upon it so you don't spend too long. Otherwise, that's going to lead to, you know, um, exhaustion, misery, and burnout. Yeah. Um, so you don't want to live there. You don't want to stay too long in the, that place. And the act on it is the big thing, you know, yeah. so being aware of something is one thing, but actually you've then got to do something with it. So the awareness alone is not going to get you there. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that I get people to journal is the framework that you, you're familiar with, which is win, learn, change, which is the, you know, so it's, it, so if they're journaling daily, what I 
invite my my people that I work with to do is to use wind land change, which is the Thomas Edison strategy that he used many years ago. So, you know, the guy that invented the light bulb, he was he did something like 10,000 experiments. And one of the first uh, reporters, journalists asked him a, a really interesting question. It was one of the first questions he was asked. He said, how does it feel to have failed 9,999 times? And Ed Edison sort of thought for a moment and he said, actually, I, I didn't fail. He said, I did an experiment and I always got a result. It wasn't the result that I wanted, but I got a result nonetheless. Yeah. He said, but what I did was I went back to the drawing board. I went back to my journal. I wrote down what worked well in that experiment. I then wrote down what I learned. And then I wrote down what I need to change for the next experiment. So he used that process of incremental change and that that got him the light bulb yes so and change change you know let's be honest change tends to happen incrementally yes you, some people do have that road to damascus moment where they see the light and it's a profound life-changing event but on a whole it tends to be step by step mm. and recognizing that's really important um, because if you want to go somewhere you want to move to a different place in you know in terms of your psychological well-being your performance then get on the first step the first step is definitely the most important um it sounds like a cliche but often we sort of only see the end point think oh i'll never get there well what what would step one look like describe exactly. it try it out see if it works for you and then we'll you know get to a, used to doing that and before you know it you're moving on to two three and four yeah it's the old classic saying isn't it the uh, a, a, a a, the thousand mile journey starts with a single step you know mm. so that that classic you know that thing well i'm looking at that picture behind you that three thousand mile <laughs> journey you've done 10 times or something ridiculous yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it's um it's getting off that i mean that's actually not the biggest part of it it's the i'm sure you agree the biggest part is the two years of training before you even turn up on the start line yes and getting that's getting out of bed the first day to get on your bike and do the do the 20 mile ride before you do the overnight weekend rides and yes yeah. it, it it's the same for all all change but that's a more extreme example yeah yeah typical of me being extreme so <laughs> which just then... gonna say talking about extreme um <laughs> i know we've seen your profile jim you know the eip profile yes. um and you've happily lent us yours as a case study but if you've ever done the emotional intelligence profile or any other of these psychometric tools for development we tend to get preoccupied with how did i compare against other people yeah and i think the reason we do that is because they sell more tests that way companies want to know well where are you on the benchmark how are you better or worse but at the end of the day when you're talking about development you, you know you're talking about not comparing yourself against others and we we society is built like that when yeah. all people do nowadays is tell you about the great things they've done. They don't tell you about the bad stuff on social media. Um, but it's the same with EIP. When you're comparing against a norm group, don't get bogged down with that. You may just be a bit tougher on yourself or you may be over generous. Um, I'd be more concerned about your relative differences between the scales Yeah. Um, for development purposes. We're not selecting you for a job. We're not trying to compete with any other people. Just look at, even if yours are all ones and twos, you'll, three might be your strength yeah yes relatively yes. yeah it's a good point the uh, some people do get bogged you're you're right some people do get bogged down with the comparison i always prefer to think about it as a stake in the ground so it's an, an awareness mm. seeking uh missile if you like you know mm. sort of it's a stake in the ground of where you are right now and and again talking about low self-regard someone with a low self-regard will typically score themselves lower on a lot of the other scales because of their low self-regard. Yeah. So if they've got a low self-regard, they're self-deprecating and they say, oh yeah, compared to others, I'm not as good. Yeah. And that's where they get uh, caught up because a lot of the questions in the questionnaire are asking compared to others, how do you see yourself? Yeah. So some, yeah, there's even, you know, other people would rate you, and 360 is quite a good idea, getting other people, because yes. you're something like, oh God, I, I rate myself. And invariably people do, by the way, their self ratings are somewhat lower than other people's ratings mm. of them. Mm. One of the other things I've got written down here, Joe, is to um, surround yourself with positive people. And again, you know, so someone that's got a low self-regard, 
surround yourself with good people that uh, make you feel good about yourself, but also mm -hmm. uh, give you, you know, you have a bit of a laugh, a bit of banter, mm -hmm. uh, a smile more, mm -hmm. and uh, making sure that you get rid of. So actually have a detox of the negative people. Mm -hmm. My, you know, so my eldest daughter has recently done that uh, mm -hmm. with great effect, and she feels so much better mm -hmm. about getting rid of some of the people that aren't particularly um, positive in her life and not adding to mm. her life. It's It sounds quite brutal, but it's really powerful to declutter yeah. that energy because there's yeah. an energy that people transmit. And, and, you know, they say that emotions are contagious. And we know that with things like mirror neurons and oscillating. If, if you're, you know, at an event and everyone's having fun, you tend to laugh along, don't you? You feel taken into it. And if you're looking at comedy, you start brightening the mood and you can create that emotional climate around you as well. So if people are down, you know, you could shift their mindset. Ultimately, if you're unable to do it, you know, you might have to move away, at least for a while. Mm. I was telling you before we spoke, Jim, I, you know, asking what we did over the weekend. I went to see um, my my um, girlfriend's uh, uncle, who's 91 years old, in, and we spent three days in Wales. And, you know, a uh, 91 year old, I think he is certainly at the end of his life, but he, he's, I've never known anyone to laugh so often. Um, and he was, you know, it's, it's wonderful to spend time with somebody at that age, laughing at everything and enjoying life. Um, yeah. And I felt good. I was, you know, going to see the in-laws type of thing. You know, oh, this could be a challenging couple of days, but it wasn't. I really enjoyed it because that person in his presence, I felt good about myself because we yeah. just had a lot of laughter and maybe that's another aspect of building your self-esteem find opportunities even if you're having tough times which we you will for joy yes um fun laughter it could be people it could be events it could be memories um find find that stuff because it will release those positive endorphins and feelings and get them more you know it's like oiling a car get, getting it you used more um they'll become more accessible yeah, no, you're right. I mean, there was there's there've been some studies looking at people that have not, you know, uh, enhancing their well being through watching comedy. So, you know, a whole load of, you know, movie after movie, you know, um, comedy movies that make them laugh. You know, so which is causing the serotonin, oxytocin, you know, the dopamine uh, hit that we need. You know, so that's that's helping them. There was a study done many years ago that I might have spoken to you about. You, you'll probably be aware of, Joe, that um, looked at mildly depressed patients, you know, mm. about 100 mildly depressed patients. Mm. And what they got them to do for two weeks was they got a pen. And I'm not rec we're not recommending this to people that are listening to this, by the mm. way. This is not a leadership um, motivational thing. Mm, but mm. It, it, what they did was they got them to, for three times per day for 15 mm. minutes they got them to put a pen in their mouth and mm. of course that that caused a smile which mm. triggered off the serotonin and oxytocin and at the end of the study after two weeks they were feeling better and mm. their, so their mild depression had been improved mm. and it's just a reminder that smiling is really critical mm. even even a little sneaky smile that i'm doing to you now with my eyes that's triggering serotonin mm. in me when it lands on you that mm. causes a trigger of serotonin in you then you mm. sneaky little mm. fellow will smile back at me that'll give you another hit mm. and gives me another hit so it's mm. a really lovely mm. setup to mm. you know enhance your mood yeah and it's, and yeah, sorry, it goes both ways. I just know that some people can bring you down and before you know it, you're getting getting sort of crushed. Yeah, and that's what I mean by getting rid of some of the energy vampires. So get rid of those people that uh, all they want to do is talk about doom and gloom. You know, mm. the government this, mm. the uh, the bills this, the bills that, the kids this, yeah. you yeah. know, the boss this, you know, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And actually, before you know it, you're thinking... Oh, I was actually in a good space a moment ago, and now I'm feeling dreadful. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be yeah, conscious. Yeah, can of lock that. us in. Um, when you're talking about that pen in the mouth thing, I was thinking of um, uh, modelling um, other people, and certainly, you know, in the early days, I was saying the previous podcast I worked with teenagers, and particularly in building their self-esteem, and um, 
one thing that really works well with young people and we don't practice it enough as adults is is modeling uh, role yes. role modeling of copying if you like yeah um and they don't just do it by you know learning about them they pretend that they are them yes. they embody that behavior that mannerisms the style um and one way of doing that is think about people who've inspired you who've got you in that place and you know actually embody what it is to be like that or mm. time in your life when you've been like that and relive it so simply changing your demeanor uh, your posture your voice can make you feel different it's difficult to stand up tall walk confidently talk confidently and feel weak um yeah so it, they, all these different elements of us interact so changing your behavior your body will change your feelings yeah. and they'll galvanize different positive thoughts and so on and so forth so it's a really good idea to change the physical side as well a hundred percent i agree entirely the um, we 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 talk about in uh, our, the coaching program that that i run when i'm working with leaders is we talk about specifically those points the four keys to short-term change your state so you you've just talked about posture we were talking about smiling so posture smiling um and then also movement so movement's really important as well so once you've been sat in a chair for 45 minutes you once your bum goes numb the next thing that goes numb is your your brain so mm. making sure that if you're in the office and you're on the computer that you take a, a stroll around the office or go outside and get some fresh air so movement's critical so it's movement posture how you hold yourself how you sit uh, smiling and then the big one which is the the the, the huge one that the spiritual gurus have been speaking about for centuries is breath and mm. breath work. So mm. Mm. being conscious of your breath and deliberately slowing your breath down. So if you've got an important meeting, making sure you slow that down before you go into it. And there's a Huberman I, I learned from one of his recent podcasts uh, about the Huberman breath. So he's talking about, and there's research that if you're really stressed, one of the things that you can do is take a, a, a take a breath. So you take a breath and then take a sneaky little one on top of it. So take a breath and then an extra one, hold it and then let it out and then do it again. And then you take a breath and then a sneaky one on top, hold it and then let it go and then straight away you you feel so much I mean, the research is overwhelming mm. in in that regard in 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 particular that breath yeah. so um and it's that's what i like about huberman's stuff he it's neuro he's a neuroscientist mm. and it's researched and it's it's really cool finally i just want to talk about the the final thing that i made a note of which was and this happens a lot with people that i've coached over the years when they have a low self-regard, they typically put themselves last on the list of the three things that I talk about that are really important. Mm. So self is important. Family is important. And then career. So they're the three big things that we all grapple with. Mm. And someone with a low self-regard, if they, if I ask them to order those three things in terms of priority, in terms of where are they spending most of their time, typically it comes back to family then they talk about work as number two position and then they talk about themselves as number three mm -hmm. and that's fairly consistent so over the years that consistently comes back in that order mm. and the the tricky thing is to get them to realize that actually self is more important they've got to put themselves first mm -hmm. so if i'm happy and comfortable in my skin in, love mm. myself warts mm. and all mm. i'll be more able to support the family because i'm happy and comfortable in myself and i'll be happier and more engaged at work because i'm not feeling bad that i've missed out on a gym session because i've got to get to work or pick up the kids or cook dinner or clean the house or whatever it might be mm. that so putting yourself first and and I, as i say that I, I think about the the single parents, so the single parents that are, that might not be able to do that because they've got an obligation to take care of their children, and that's true. 
what I would say to those listeners is that they do need to craft some time to self. So that could be perhaps a simple thing like getting up a little bit earlier and, you know, doing a, a gym session or, or whatever it might be, but mm-hmm. making sure that they create some time for themselves because that, that's the critical thing. So again, it's about tr- attempting to get yourself into the space of putting yourself first. And it sounds selfish. And that's, I get pushback from a lot of people saying, yeah, but that isn't that selfish. And it's sort of, yeah, but you're not really getting it, getting, you're not getting my point. The point is that actually you have to be happy with yourself to be able to give fully to others that you care about. And of course, um, so I'm I'm interested in hearing what you what you have to, what what's your experience around that as well, Jim. It, it takes me back to the the framework which you introduced at the beginning, and you know we've mentioned, haven't we, that some people are real helpers and get their boxed into the right hand side of the framework. Yes, but as you can see, the arrows go from the left to the right. They do work both ways, by the way, but yeah. the dominant direction is, as you're saying, it's very difficult to help others in the long term if you're not caring for yourself initially and it, it kind of manifests as people you know those feelings don't just go away they turn into sort of um feeling like a victim yes. everything i do is never appreciated i do my best i'm exhausted and you, you know you end up taking it out on other people taking it out on yourself and ultimately unable to help other people yeah. so there's a, there's a close link i think there's i think there are differences as well that some people are more locked into the selfish side and other mm-hmm. people into the unselfish side and there are individuals who actually maybe it's a time in their life to start giving back um i wouldn't say always selfish often dare i say it people who've got to a certain age often male uh worked in a certain industry and actually have been locked into earning a living and working yeah. predominantly on achievement for what they can achieve, obviously for themselves, but often it's for their family. But they're so locked into doing that, they've unaware. Um, and it's about moving from the top layer of the framework back to awareness. So what is it I want in life? What mm. do I want to achieve? And actually, it may be for those individuals, it is a bit more about helping others than helping yourself. So it can it can work both ways on on the on the frame on the ei side of things yeah and i think that's a a nice segue into the next level up which you know i know i know you're keen to talk about which is the self awareness and awareness of others scale which is the feelings level mm. so maybe maybe if i get you to talk about that and talk about how you know your experience your thinking around the self awareness stuff i I'd, I'd like to add some stuff as well but i'd just like to hear your thoughts joe <laughs> thanks jim um so last time we unpacked the self-regard regard for others through the two by two matrix uh what we call the attitude matrix or originally it's the life positions of thomas harris and transactional analysis and there's a lot of depth to that of course but yeah we're talking about the jam in the middle the awareness bit is the core to emotional intelligence yeah um self-awareness um, which is our third scale on the EIP, is about being aware of your emotions um, and how they how they affect you. So it's aware of your physiology, it's aware, aware of your feelings, aware of your intuition. As distinct maybe from other tools like personality measures, may talk about self awareness as in your knowledge, knowing your behaviour. Mm. So I know I'm an introvert. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I have these characteristics, and these behaviours. That's not quite the same. With emotional intelligence, we're talking about noticing, paying attention to the the bodily. It's very much being in the present. It's very much being aware of yourself at the present time Um, and how those feelings affect you, um, managing and choosing what to do about those feelings as opposed to just allowing them to take free reign, Mm. Um, noticing where they come from. So as we see in our model, self-regard largely influences our underlying attitude, influence and they create the patterns that trigger off these feelings and those feelings influence how we think and they influence how we behave which is the management level of of the framework so yeah we could talk about and and if you think about the description of emotional intelligence um often describe it as thinking about your feelings to guide your behavior yes so it's thinking about your feelings being aware of noticing paying attention to what's going on for me labeling them accurately 
to guide what I choose to do about it. So emotional intelligence is a doing, it's a verb, it's something in the present. Yeah, and we, and I spoke about Magoo on the, the last episode and awareness around that, and you talked about your car metaphor. One of the metaphors that I I use around awareness is the the fingerprint metaphor which i you know i think is really really powerful for leaders for individuals to be really conscious of so if i pick this glass up i leave my fingerprint on the glass everyone's conscious of that we've got a unique fingerprint that's unique to us so every interaction that we have with somebody whether it's you know our intimate relationships or work colleagues or a stranger we leave a fingerprint in that interaction. Now, depending on how emotionally intelligent I am, if I've got a really high emotional intelligence, I'll pick the glass up and I'll deliberately, because I'm mindful, I'll deliberately leave a positive fingerprint in that interaction. Mm-hmm. So I'll go out of my way to, to be mindful and I'm aware enough to deliberately leave a, finger, a positive fingerprint in that interaction. If I've got a mediocre emotional mm-hmm. intelligence... So some days good, some days not so good, or some moments good, some moments not so good. So I'm not, you know, so I'm sort of 50, 50, you know, with my emotional intelligence, I'll pick the glass up, I'll leave a fingerprint on it. And it's possible that I might crack the glass on those Mm. not so good moments during Mm. the day. Mm. So we, this is about the awareness piece. And then, of course, if you follow the metaphor all the way through, if I've got very low emotional intelligence, I'll pick the glass up and it's likely that I'll shatter the glass. So I'm operating out of awareness. I might give someone some feedback, but in a very inappropriate way. The look I give with someone would be, you know, like not particularly good at all. The the eye roll, all those things, they're subtle fingerprints that we're leaving in all of those interactions now as a leader when they've got their team with them all eyes are on the leader in terms of uh, they're picking up signals cues all the time uh, how things are said how the words the the language that they're using how they're saying it as you were saying earlier so this is about awareness of the fingerprint so the first thing is awareness of self-awareness which we're talking about self-awareness of how I'm interacting with everyone that I interact with. And there are three groups, Joe, that I I sort of clump people into three groups. Mm. And, and I hierarchy those groups as well. So the first group is our intimate relationships. So, and the most important, I believe they're the most important aspect to us as human beings. So the intimate relationships we have, our partner, our kids, our our family, our close friends. So those are the intimate relationships. And the reason I consider those to be the most important is that they are our life support system. They're our sort of fans that cheer us on, that support us, that help us do, you know, and and support us in the goals that we're pursuing. And, and unfortunately, sometimes, unfortunately, quite often, sometimes, we take those individuals for granted. Mm-hmm. So being conscious and being aware of the fingerprint that we're leaving in those interactions with our intimate relationships. Yeah, I think you brought together all the different parts there for me where self-awareness, it's influenced by underneath what's going on in your relationships, your your, your own self-concept and other people influence you. It impacts on, you know, your awareness on other people um, and it impacts on the other parts of the framework which are how you manage your own behavior in relationships and you know i think you can take from your metaphor there all those different parts mm. and maybe if i draw upon some of those parts in terms of the the model uh, to yeah. give a few examples so well, just, i mean under just the, before just yeah, before you do let yeah. me just uh, the, so the the intimate relationships is one of that's the first position the second mm. position is our relationships with people at work so mm second most important uh, because we spend a lot of our time at work and we interact with people at work so again being conscious of the fingerprint that we're leaving in those Mm. situations with our Mm. our colleagues our boss etc so that's position number two position number three is all the all the random people that we meet so you know when i'm at the checkout at my grocery store when i'm filling up the car and paying for that Mm -hmm. the you know the when i'm meeting or bumping into people on on the train or whatever it might be Mm -hmm. so those random interactions where 
I probably won't see that individual ever again. Mm. But why not deliberately leave a positive fingerprint, even if it's just very subtle, a smile or whatever it might be, mm. or just pick out something that, oh, you've got a really, that a, you know, that really suits you, that color or that coats, you know, you look good in that, et cetera, those things. Be authentic with it. Mm. You don't have to um, make stuff up. But so if 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 we if we did that, so intimate relationships, our relationships, you know, and if if we were conscious of the fingerprint that we were leaving in all of those interactions, including the the people that we might not ever see again, mm. the world would be a wonderful place. Mm, mm, mm. It would be utopia, you know, because we're all interacting in a in a in a really conscious at a, mm. at a conscious level mm, mm. and i'm not sure mm. whether i spoke about the um kids animation that i saw over christmas last year the child the fox the mole the horse i don't know whether you've seen, I don't think it I've seen that one it's no. beautiful it yeah. is absolutely it's a great animation and the one of i think the mole asks the young boy what do you want to be when you grow up which yeah. i think is a fantastic question <laughs> And it's been asked, there have been lots of different asks. This, the answer was beautiful. Yeah. The young boy said, I want to be kind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it blew me away. It was like, mm -hmm. wow, what a clever piece of writing, scripting mm -hmm. for, f as a message to the world. Mm -hmm. I, I want to be kind. If we were all wired that way. Mm. I, I want to be kind. Well, mm. wars would be, wouldn't be a thing. Mm. Mm. You know, rude and angry people wouldn't be a thing. Mm. Mm. You know, it, it, it's amazing. So I, I interrupted your, 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 not, your, not really. your adding to. So I, yeah, yeah, please, yeah. please do yeah. add, add Joe. Yeah. Cause it's all, it's all going back in this cycle of just checking in with yourself and maybe, you know, from, from what you're saying it's really about doing that more often and then mm -hmm. recognizing the impact what we're doing has on other people and sometimes to do that we need to you need to stop and think you know stop and notice it inside yourself yeah. and notice where it's coming from you know because we're talking about self-regard before and clearly if i have low self-regard and i'm feeling rubbish about myself i might have all sorts of painful feelings i don't want to acknowledge mm. uh, pay attention to and they're, they're uncomfortable so that immediately distorts my self-awareness and I sort of bury those feelings. Um, and if I'm not self-aware, it's very difficult to start improving other facets of my behavior, like dealing with setbacks, building relationships with other people. Um, so I think emotional self-regard and self-awareness are intimately connected. Um, and if you don't pay attention to your feelings, sooner or later, they're just gonna, they're gonna grow stronger. They don't sort of disappear. They need to be acknowledged and acted upon. I use the metaphor of, you know, if you're if you're a manager of a company and you don't pay attention to the feedback you get from the workforce, then sooner or later they're going to get pretty disgruntled, um, and they might give you more and more feedback, and they may start working a bit differently and underperforming. But if you just continually ignore and ignore it, rather like you might ignore your feelings, sooner or later what what's going to happen? Well, well they might go on strike. Yeah. Um, rather like the same with feelings you might your body goes on strike um you become unwell and so the metaphor i have is is your feelings are like your body because feelings live in the body yes um and your brain if you like is the management and it's important that the two work together mm. otherwise you get all of these problems are going on in the industry today um noticing paying attention to what's going on on a day-to-day -day momentary basis and that will make life much easier and you can respond to things rather like the metaphor of managing your car and looking after it. If you don't look after your well-being or pay attention to what's going on with the engine and tires and all the other stuff, then it might start to break down. Uh, so consider feelings as useful feedback that. Uh, oh, ma massively, massively so. And actually, it's interesting you say all that, Joe. You've, you've triggered off some thoughts for me around all that. The, the data, the neuroscience behind it is fascinating i the one of the books that i've read recently was when the body says no by gabor matter and they've done he's done research around this and basically we don't really think about this often but every thought that we have creates a chemical cascade mm -hmm. so every thought so we and we have 
thousands of thoughts every day. A lot of them are the same thoughts, actually, interestingly, but thousands upon thousands of thoughts every day. And that creates a chemical cascade. So every thought, bang, chemical cascade. Now, if we're wired negatively, it's no wonder that we're, we're at dis-ease with ourselves. We're not comfortable in our skin, in our body, as you say, because that's where the feelings live. So we're bombarding ourselves with those thoughts, those, those and which create feelings mm. which aren't healthy. So mm. we're at dis-ease with ourselves, which mm. created mm. which creates disease in our body. Mm. So and lots and again, neuroscience is backing this up. You know, if we're the you know, if we're negatively wired, there's a higher chance of cancers and a whole load of other ailments. Mm -hmm. So it's being conscious of making sure that we're aware of our thoughts and, and what we're thinking. And so that's where the awareness piece is, is so, so crucial. As mm -hmm. you've said already, it's, it's critical that we're conscious of, and, and I think the key to some of this, and I know we spoke about it last, last week, Joe is, and, it, and it's, Pretty much most leaders that I've worked with over the last 20 odd years on it, when I'm working one on one, the biggest thing they need all all of them have needed to do is to slow down. So, you know, we, we, we talk about taking a breath and becoming present. So slowing down to this moment now. I always, I always think it's funny. I love it when people talk about multitasking. You, you can't do multitask. It's not, I, it's not possible to do. I mean, people would argue, right? And I'm sure the listeners are probably thinking, yeah, I can multitask. But actually, you're not fully present. If I'm not fully present now talking to you and I'm thinking about writing down some stuff or doing an email while I'm talking to you, I'm not fully present to you and to this conversation yeah. i'm my my brain's occupied by doing other stuff so that's what i mean by we can't do more you can multitask yeah. but you're not fully present in either of those things that you're you're doing yes so so yeah i mean continuing on with that um the relationship between the self-awareness and other aspects of your behavior it's going to impact on if you know if you know some of the scales that come from the emotional intelligence profile we talk about emotional resilience mm -hmm. and if you're not aware of your feelings um it certainly helps if you notice your feelings sooner before they you know irritation becomes anger or a little bit of worry becomes great stress yes so paying attention to your feelings earlier mm. uh, it will help you develop your your resilience and coping strategies it'll help you in several other ways like um if you were, you know, connecting with other people, uh, yes. forming relationships, we often form relationships by sharing ourselves, being open about ourselves, not just cognitive thoughts or telling people what we've been doing, but sharing our vulnerabilities, sharing yeah. our feelings. Of course, if you're not aware of your feelings, it's quite difficult to make that connection. Mm. Uh, and some people don't literally don't pay attention to their feelings. So the conversation never gets to that level. Yeah, they don't know how people, to articulate yeah. it. No. <laughs> it's, it's people who have fun, spontaneous, emotional re interrelationships that get closer, trusting connections because you feel you know the person mm. yeah, if you want to build trust. And we mentioned, you know, awareness of others as well. If you, you know, it's, it's directly connected. If you want to build awareness of others, we need to put ourselves in other people's shoes. Yes. And if you can't, if you've never experienced those feelings or you can't relate to another person's particularly when they're difficult feelings, you know, painful, you know, feelings of grief, sadness, mm -hmm. uh, worry. It doesn't mean you have to feel that way all the time, but it's certainly if you're helping somebody or coaching somebody, it's much better if you've got a sense of un understanding, uh, empathizing with them, if you like, really yes. feeling how they might have felt. So, and the, the self-awareness as it is crucial to all aspects of emotional intelligence it's also crucial to the relationship side scale. So you've got things like conflict handle, handling, emotional expression, control, which sound very much to do with the relationships. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you're, if you're not noticing feelings early and they build up and up, they grow stronger and stronger, then it's going to end up impacting on other people. Yes. So you go from being quite passive or emotionally controlled, keeping everything tight, 
and sooner or later it over it it, it over spills yes um, and it you become emotionally under controlled or you become quite aggressive now that's impacting your relationships but if prior to then you'd noticed it was going on inside of you you had better self-awareness then you wouldn't have got to the stage of it getting to the you know the too much side of the scale yeah spilling into the relationship and the conversation that you're attempting to have yeah it's it's great it's sort of like almost bubbles over and actually it's 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 so interesting it's the it's the the piece of this is the, the and we'll get into the uh, uh, the other scales perhaps in a, one of the next ep- episodes because i think it's it's important to i i my my goal is to help people understand this in in a bit of detail so hence the reason for not wanting to rush into and go deep into some of the other scales at this stage the self awareness piece is the it's it's the key that opens the door to everything you know yeah. it really yeah. is it sort of it opens the floodgates so it's about awareness and and about the patterns of behavior that you're running and your awareness of those patterns of behavior. And, and in coaching, we talk about the mirror work. We always mm. talk about the mirror work. So look in the mirror first before you look at others. Yeah. And and one of one of the books that I recommend to people that I work with is Leadership and Self Deception, which is uh, written by the Arbinger Institute, and they talk about um, Albert Semmelweis. So I don't know whether we've spoken about this, Joe, which is a professor back in the late 1800s. Now, interestingly, their mortality rates uh, in his hospital were higher than anywhere else in uh, Austria. And he couldn't understand it because he thought that his hospital was meant to be, you know, he was a professor. He he looked at every aspect to try and nail down what was going on. You know, he looked at the nursing, he looked at other doctors, he looked at you know, every procedure and all the incremental bits that the steps before, you know, and was trying to understand why their mortality rates was higher. He then went on holiday for two weeks and the mortality rates dropped Mm. significantly so that he had to then start thinking, oh, this could be me. Mm. So it was actually him. He was doing all the autopsies and he was transferring disease from dead patients Mm. to live patients because he wasn't washing his hands so Mm. when we've had this bout of covid the biggest thing that they said you could do was to wash your hands to you know to use the the bacterial stuff to get the germs Mm. off Mm. so that's Mm. how uh, disease was transferred so covid one of the biggest things we could all do was to actually wash our hands and that came from albert semmelweis yeah, and it's fascinating. And what's fascinating about the book is it creates the awareness for the leader that actually, before you look at other people, take a look in the mirror and ask yourself the question: What am I doing or not doing that's creating this pattern of behavior in other people? So, mm-hmm. am I either doing this or not doing this? Mm-hmm. Before you start saying it's them, you know, yeah. or, or yeah. blaming whatever. Yeah. So, and the mirror work is really powerful. So the mirror work helps you then dive into your awareness mm. and it enhances your your awareness. And I think you were going to talk about, sorry, Joe. Well, I, this, this just brings up the close relationship between self-awareness and, and awareness of others yes. on, on our framework and paying attention to others. I mean, awareness of others is, is similar to what is the self-awareness, but it's on others. So noticing the feelings, intuitions, uh, noting what's going on for other people, mm-hmm. uh, paying attention to other people. And you could do that uh, consciously. Uh, so I could notice um, somebody's tapping their finger on the table nervously and say, well, what's going on? What's going on for them? Are they a bit anxious or, or frustrated? Yes. Um, and uh, I mean, there's certain personality types that are perhaps more aware of others. They're more um, p- noticing their environment. They're less internal. Mm. So some people may be better at self-awareness because they've got a more introverted awareness of what's going on for them, while other people are more oriented externally. So they pay mm-hmm. attention to, to the outer environment. Um, they're more observant naturally. So they might be strong on that. But there's also an intuitive side to noticing others, uh, sensing what's going on for them. So, for example, Paul Ekman, uh, who studied sort of facial features, emotional mm-hmm. expressions, 
uh, identified about 10,000 different facial micro gestures. Yeah. I mean, there's no way you're ever going to remember what Remarkable. the Omar knows them. But the brain is hardwired to actually anticipate, understand the facial expressions and what they mean. We may not know why we picked it up in that person. We, we can tell, oh, maybe they're a bit worried or maybe they're not interested in what I'm talking about um, or maybe they want to want to talk about something else it's it's that ability to sense uh intuitively that there's a part of the brain that does this instinctively if you like and again it's probably just to you know uh keep us safe um to you know i an anticipate any risk or threat in the environment uh so you know an, an infant a baby will automatically be able to read a, a parent's face very quick very early on where whether they're they're happy or sad or annoyed with us or whatever yeah very clever so there's different types of being aware of others it's you know there's a conscious there's the intuitive side and then there's the em empathic side that we've mentioned already where mm -hmm. you can actually sense other people's feelings and as a coach i imagine jim you spend quite a lot of time exp you, you mentioned earlier about uh, moving away that from people that may bring you down mm -hmm. and that's probably if you're very empathic you're going to experience their feelings yeah uh, more than others might do you yeah. won't necessarily ignore them no, uh, you, you're right. You're bang on. And I, I do. I am a very sensing uh, feeling sort of person. So I do use my intuition quite a bit. And actually, I encourage people that I work with to use it more. So almost go on a fishing ex expedition. So around a team meeting, I would get them to try and um, enhance their intuition by if you're sensing that with somebody then just ask or, or ask the question, you know, I, I'm sensing that m maybe not everyone's on board with this or, uh, you know, I'm sensing maybe a little bit of unease here or, or confusion. So, you know, so invite that, you know, so then you're getting feedback instead of just letting it go. You're then getting feedback in that situation, in that moment. And it is something you can develop. Isn't yes. it? It's like, you know, you can become more tuned. I think we all have this intuition and capacity for empathy uh, well, I say all, there are some individuals who generally, you know, cognitively do really struggle with it, but we can improve the capacity to pick up on other people's feelings and yeah. just um, by, by through self-awareness, if I notice I'm feeling anxious, then maybe it's because the people around me are nervous about something. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you want, you want evidence of that, you know, if, if you're, um, if you see people who've had an accident or hurt themselves or hit them, hit their arms or, and you wince in pain that's empathy yeah yes. so if you're experiencing what other people do then then you have got you are demonstrating empathy and i, I know you were you were going to talk about the the feelings grid that um i can share on, on screen with folks now if they're mm -hmm. watching it on on video so th this is pluckett's uh feelings grid okay i don't know whether you've got a copy of it there joe but uh, what can you just talk us through the wheel of you know the different feelings because actually a lot of people don't necessarily label them but that that's part of the self-awareness piece isn't it it's noticing the feeling labeling it and thinking about it and then acting in a different way to change it mm. so so maybe if you just sing out some of those those different feelings that are on on Pluckett's yeah, I mean, there's it, it's the, the great thing about. I mean, I I and, and I don't know if it's Pluckett or Pluchik, but it's, Pluchik. Uh, well, I, I don't know. My my pronunciation's <laughs> terrible. It's, uh, I mean, he was one of several people who've explored sort of uh, different and come up with models and frameworks for different types of emotions. But generally, they tend to say this, the same thing that we have some core underlying fundamentals between all humans, all cultures, all backgrounds. We all feel a certain amount of joy, sadness, fear, anxiety, and so forth. But rather like the primary colors, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the fundamentals are there, but you can blend them infinitely. You can get infinite number of different uh, combinations. Yes. Um, and I say the same with emotions. We can have all an infinite number of different feelings. And the more and more uh, aware of those that we are, the better we are at, uh, at dealing with them and managing them. But when we talk about feelings, you know, we're talking about different, we might be talking about emotions, which are things on this wheel, those different labels, and our interpretation of those. 
uh, we could be talking about our sort of physiological body. So, mm -hmm. you know, pain or tension, which is going on inside of us. Or we may again be going back to the sort of intuitive feeling, which is a sense of unease or a hunch or gut feeling. And all of those are very important. I think what I really like about these models is they are an organ they, they give a sense of organization of of how emotions may be broken down. So we can describe emotions as being pleasant or unpleasant. Some people talk about them as being positive or negative. Yes. It's not a phrase I, I would choose because I think all emotions are useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, you know, there's, a, there's an evolutionary reason for why we, we have pain or we have fear or we have anger because it's informative. Yeah, it's and feedback, the as we, you were saying. It, yeah. yeah, the worst thing we can do is not accept our feelings and ignore them or pretend that they're different from what they are. And it's interesting as you say that because people do bottle them down you know they they bottle them up they don't and, that, and that's when it gets into the conflict handling piece that you were mm. talking about earlier where they bottle it up bottle it up and then they go bang they yes. it's got to go somewhere eventually or yeah. they create disease within themselves so mm. you know they're stressed and they're angry and you know eventually they'll pop you know they've, mm. they've got mm. to let the cork out some at some point mm. so yeah i mean this is uh, too much emotion and not managing our emotions can really interfere with our abilities. So, you know, interferes with our ability to think clearly, mm -hmm. um, for example, or our cognitive capacity, our IQ. Mm -hmm. Too much emotion tends to stop us accessing our ability to to, to the higher cortex to work yeah. things out, to see fine grit. And we tend to become far more judgmental. Things are either right, wrong. It's like the categorical side to our brain. Yes, and it and it and it makes us more uh, more assertive, more judgmental in our decision making. Mm. So yeah, it narrows our awareness, focuses our attention, makes us more judgmental, and ultimately we make generally worse decisions. And most sort of thinking problems come about from too much emotion or not yes. managing our emotions effectively. Yeah, it's interesting because you uh, you re just reminded me of something that I do share with individuals is that it's best not to make a decision when you're not in a good space. So mm. if you're in a, one of those moods that, and you're not happy, you're angry, you're frustrated, those thoughts, feelings will not help you make good decisions. So be in a space, in a state mentally where you're in a good state, you make better decisions there. And and I think it, it speaks to what you just said there, which is you're more able to access your innovation, your creativity, et cetera, because you're mm. you're you're in that higher space in the in the brain where you can access it more readily. If mm. you're you're pushed down and negative, then you're not gonna readily access your creativity, your innovation, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. And your thinking skills, you know, your thinking yeah. skills. Yeah, so there's too much emotion. There's also too little emotion where you become disengaged, demotivated or bored. There's almost a, um, a, an up and down curve. Uh, the yerkes dobson performance arousal curve, we're told it is. But <clears throat> ideally, you want to get an optimal level. Yes. Where you engage, focused, attentive. Too much actually creates anxiety and stress. And too little creates disengagement and demotivation. Um, so learning to get that optimal level, you're talking about athletes before as well. Mm. Um, they've got to get themselves really focused, but not burn up all their energy before they've jumped off the start line. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, the, uh, a high adrenaline and, and then they burn out mm. Mm. so that they've got it in reserve. So emotions, yeah, they can be the intensity and you've also got the positive, I was mentioning the positive or negative or pleasant or unpleasant and the danger with too many unpleasant emotions it takes us down a negative spiral we start seeing the world more negatively or we might perceive others more negatively it's like having a looking through a lens that's clouded um it's not giving us a true present representation mm. true awareness of what's going on yeah so i might become very blaming or critical of other people whatever it is they do they seem to an annoy me why is it every time I try and help you, you don't you, you don't appreciate me? So the victim or the, yeah. or the critic or I, I, you know, sometimes as a coach, we try to help people really because it's dealing with our own stuff. 
so I become over helpful I, I become trying to help you with your problems so I don't have to look at my own stuff yeah no completely yeah that that's a that's a good pattern it keeps you distracted mm. so, you so this is what's to... happening when we get into this negative emotional mindset um our, our defenses are easily triggered yes um and then it you know we could become more demanding as you know we expect others to look after him you know you don't care about me you don't love me enough you don't do enough for me so we're putting it's all it's all about pointing the finger externally towards other people rather mm. than noticing them for myself so emotions yeah you've got the positive side you've got the un uncomfortable side and then you've got the different levels of intensity sort of high strong emotions or less strong calmer emotions and if you put those two dimensions together you get a matrix of four different types of emotion yeah and I quite like that as a, um, an organizing model for understanding, uh, you know, our feelings. Yeah, no, it's clever. It's very clever. And and being conscious of when you're in the quadrant that could lead to burnout, you know, where yeah. you're stressed, yeah. angry, frustrated. And, not, and not usually this is a type of, you know, it's cyclical. So, you know, in the workplace, people like us to be enthusiastic and energetic, which is a positive positive pleasant emotions which are high energy but it's easy to overdo that mm -hmm. and that's when people move into the high energy but it's not very comfortable these are anxiety stress uh frustration anger possibly these are emotions that they can be very productive but they tend to upset a lot of other people around us and if you stay like that if you stay in this stress level in a high stress zone it's not sustainable yeah and this is when the energy levels drop mm. so you go down to sort of feeling tired and exhausted and as you mentioned burnout demotivated yeah and, and then people then um go for a coffee a cigarette um sugar cravings you know to try and boost that to enhance yeah. themselves feeling better about stuff I think the trouble is people try to go from this sort of low energy zone angry and upset or um disengaged and they try to get back to the place they were before which was feeling engaged and enthusiastic and so they give some artificial stimulant but they mm. haven't yet dealt with those emotions or where they've come from and yeah, the a... place for this and this is what i call the emotional intelligence zone is where it's low energy but positive mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. low car motions you mentioned about the breathing and then a little bit more breathing these kind of activities help calm the body relax the, the brain the mind and help us to think more clearly yes and this is low energy positive it's calm relaxed thoughtful reflective yeah and this mindful, is the yeah this is the mindful zone this is mm. the zone that's going to help you deal with the the, the the other side of the you know the red zone if you like Mm -hmm. um, that you've not been coping well with before you go back to energized yes. what you don't want to do is just jump back into that high energy da, 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 and not have dealt with the stuff that's bringing you down it's interesting i, I read a book many years ago called uh feeling the thinking feeling trap uh, mm. or the feeling thinking trap i think it was called it was uh, written in the late 1800s really profound Mm. because it was actually really simple in its in its way of trying to get you to become aware of the pattern well, typically we have so I'll, I'll give an example which might might help people think about this for a second so new year's resolution want to get fit so you set the alarm for six o'clock in the morning new new pattern of behavior and um, you, the alarm goes off, beep, 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 six o'clock in the morning. It's that's not normally the time you wake up, but mm. so you you wake up to that, and you're feeling tired. Mm. Mm. So your feeling then drives your thinking, which is, oh, I'll just hit the snooze button, or mm. not today. Mm. So our we've got to become aware of our feelings driving our thinking mm -hmm. so so currently that's that's happening for most of us on the planet our feelings are driving our thinking we've got to reorder it the other way around we to be able to switch this and mm -hmm. and create a different pattern of behaviors we've got to do the thinking to drive the feelings so 
for example, go to bed at night thinking about, okay, well, the alarm's going to go off uh, tomorrow morning at six o'clock. I'm going to have my gym bag packed. I know I'm going to probably not feel particularly great, but I'm going to get out of, as you were saying, I'm going to get out of bed and get to the car and get to the gym or whatever it is that you're doing. So it's, it's reordering that. So doing the thinking about it before it happens. So uh, preparing yeah. yourself mentally for and, that event. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I love the fact that, you know, we, we talk about the model and how they interact and, and mm. it's so true. So this is a, us thinking about our feelings. So mm. we've got to think differently if we want a different result, if, mm. if we mm. want a different feeling. So it's the thinking that drives the. So we need to get control, take back mm. control of mm. our feelings by thinking about it mm. and thinking about a different emotion or a feeling mm. that we want. Which I, then... like, I like that example of actually preparing yourself. So when you do have that automatic feeling in the morning, you've already prepared a habitual response, which is almost like doing the behavior triggers yes. a different action and a thought mm -hmm. uh, re reaction. But if you've thought about it prior prior to the event, then you're you're able to deal with it better. It happens. And and it sound it, it does really sound so simple. Oh it does. okay. I, yeah. But actually it's so tricky. We then yeah. get back caught back into the feeling thing. You know, so we then get back into the feeling that drives the thinking. So if we're not feeling particularly great, as you were saying, it's you can end up getting stuck. So you're not feeling great. So then other th thoughts come into your mind. So that so you're not feeling great about yourself. So the thinking that you have is other you bring in other mates to yeah. help yeah. that bad feeling feel even worse, which is a nightmare. I said, you could also address the feeling. And I suppose as a coach, sometimes we're dealing with people who are very uh, highly aroused, uh, highly anxious, upset, angry. Um, and because of that, there's too much emotion to actually think clearly. Mm -hmm. So they're unable to solve the problems that they've come to you with. So we are lending them our brain because we're hopefully calm. We can think yes. things through. We're less involved, of course. It's much easier when it's not us or our family. And we can help them to work things through. So we're lending them our ability to think through the problem. But if we could help them, first of all, and I know a lot of a lot of coaches go this way is start by helping them to calm the emotional brain down mm -hmm. in order to help them to use that innate resource of intelligence, of cognitive reasoning. And as you suggesting, the breathing activity or some kind of relaxation activity that helps them to slow down their feeling so yes. they can re-engage the thinking part and then start working through issues or more, more uh, helpfully yeah there's a there's a, a one of the models that i've used many years ago actually and you just reminded me of it is the slow model which mm. which ultimately is what you want people to do slow down so mm. the slow model is the s stands for stop so okay. when so just stop just stop for a moment and then the l is listen listen to the thoughts that are going on so mm -hmm. so so stop take a breath as you as you as you will do anyway listen to what's going on then the o is organize your thoughts so what what are the thoughts what are what are the options that i've got here so you know the o is organize options basically so okay mm -hmm. so what are my options here and then the the w is way to pr proceed that you know so what 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 how do i want to proceed what do i want to act on now so it's a, just a really clever way of sort of thinking about it in terms of, okay, so stop. And the old, the old fashioned way, our, our grandparents would have said, just count to 10, mm -hmm. you know, so if you're angry, mm -hmm. just go over there and count to 10, mm -hmm. you know, it just stops you thinking about yeah. something. So it's a pattern distraction. Yeah. So, yeah. so count to 10 so, or, or just take a breath. The breath is the, the most powerful way to become present again. I, I like that as an acronym because often when we're um, anxious, too much mm -hmm. emotion, we can't access all these wonderful techniques and things we've been taught to do because <laughs> our brain, we don't have access to our higher cortex. We yeah. don't have access to those subtle, clever things we used to know about. But we might just be able to remember something like an automatic acronym like SLOW, 
and mm -hmm. just do the first the thing which is stop and by the yeah. time you got to w you're ready to start thinking again yeah joe i, I think today um uh, we've we've pretty much recapped the self-regard regard for others I'm, I'm really pleased with where we've got to with regards to the self-awareness and the awareness so we've spoken a lot about self-awareness but of course once you become good at and have mastered self-awareness you can then become more aware of noticing that in others so as you say the arrows go the, following the diagram the arrows go certain ways for for a particular reason so mm. self-awareness first and then become aware of others patterns mm. of behavior mm. and noticing it. It, it also i had to have an internal chuckle earlier which i didn't mention which was the old classic body language courses that were big in the corporate world mm. some years ago that they were mm. sending sales reps on and other and leaders on to attempt to get to understand body language you know and mm. all, all this sort mm. of stuff mm. you know mm. it, it was really funny that and and of course they they are extremely helpful but also can be confusion confusing mm. as well mm. 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 just because that someone sat like this yeah. in you know i i learned very early as a coach when i'm working with a team someone sat with their arms crossed doesn't mean that they're disengaged it just might be comfortable mm. 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 so you know it's it's a, it's about that so I, I have to thank you again for being available and being able to discuss this because I know we're both passionate about it. And I think mm -hmm. hopefully the, our listeners will, will get that, but yeah. also I'm hoping that some of the gems that come up and they do bubble up, they bubble up yeah. in me and I'm, I'm hoping that they bubble up in you as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that, that this, this conversation, this dialogue is really, really helpful. And, and I'm really grateful for you giving the time to, to discuss this it's mm. it's been fantastic mm. once again so thanks ever awesome. so much joe and well, thanks and jim it's been great and it's also you know it, it i'd say it inspires me just talking about these things and reminds me of a lot of thought, thoughts you know areas i haven't maybe been focused on recently so as, as i hope it will be for your listeners as well yeah, no, perfect. Well, I look forward to speaking next week about the some of the self management scales because I mm, again, mm. you know, people will be thinking about how tos. So mm. you know, if we can come back and that's what we'll be looking mm, at, mm, you know, mm. some of the self management scales which are critical yeah. to help us manage ourselves more effectively. And I, I'm really keen to get into that because I'm, you know, I've I've have a real delight in talking. Uh, about the self-management scales the emotional resilience the personal mm. power the goal mm. directedness all those things are critical when we're trying to manage ourselves and navigate through life mm. so mm. yeah yeah and they take us back you know full circle to self-regard and Absolutely. what we're discussing at the beginning because these are the doorway into develop any any way of developing so any of these aspects will help in for support your self-regard fundamentally Perfect. Well, look, have a great weekend and look forward to catching up with you next week. Well, that's a wrap for this week's episode. Thank you for listening. Remember to share and subscribe to the EI Guru podcast. And if you have any questions, you can post them once you've subscribed. You can follow me on Instagram at the EI Guru. And you can get more information from my website, the EIGuru.com. Have a fantastic week. Bye for now.